Josiah was eight years old when he became king and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images. They broke down the altars of the Baals in his presence, and the incense altars which were above them he cut down. And the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images he broke in pieces and made dust of them and scattered it on the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He also burned the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so he did in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon as far as Naphtali and all around with axes. When he had broken down the altars and the wooden images, had beaten the carved images into powder and cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. In the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the temple, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, Messiah, the son of the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Joahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. When they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, they delivered the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites, who kept the doors, had gathered from the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim, from all the remnant of Israel, from all Judah and Benjamin, and which they had brought back to Jerusalem. Then they put it in the hand of the foreman who had the oversight of the house of the Lord, and they gave it to the workmen who worked in the house of the Lord to repair and restore the house. They gave it to the craftsmen and builders to buy hewn stone and timber for beams and to floor the houses which the kings of Judah had destroyed. And the men did the work faithfully. Their overseers were Jahath and Obadiah the Levites, of the sons of Mirari and Zechariah and Meshullam, of the sons of the Kohathites, to supervise. Others of the Levites, all of whom were skillful with instruments of music, were over the burden bearers and were overseers of all who did work in any kind of service. And some of the Levites were scribes, officers, and gatekeepers. Now when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hokiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. So Shaphan carried the book to the king, bringing the king word, saying, All that was committed to your servants they are doing. And they have gathered the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it to the hand of the overseers and the workmen. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Thus it happened when the king heard the words of the law that he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan, Abdon, the son of Micah, Shaphan, the scribe, and Isaiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me, and for those who are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. So Hilkiah and those the king had appointed went to Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tokath, the son of Hasra, keeper of the wardrobe. She dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke to her to that effect. Then she answered them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants. All the curses that are written in the book 
which they have read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be poured out on this place and not be quenched. But as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, in this manner you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and against its inhabitants, and you humbled yourself before me and you tore your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place and its inhabitants. So they brought back word to the king. And then the remainder of the chapter tells how the king went up to the temple, stood in its place, announced to all the inhabitants the covenant and called for a public renewal of the uh, obedience to the covenant. There's a word in the English lexicon that exudes a sense of religious excitement and fervor every time we hear it. It was very common in Christian circles before the founding of this country, right, in 1776. And right up to the 20th century, it's been in vogue. It is the word revival. The southern kingdom of Judah had five revivals under five different kings, under Rehoboam, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, and the young king, Josiah. Josiah came to the throne at the age of eight. Can you imagine? And his 31-year reign was marked by revival in four phases. Phase one began when Josiah had been king only eight years. That meant that when he was at the age of 16, the age most young people are walking away from the church, some are even walking into schools and blasting people with rifles. This king, we are told by the chronicler, while he was still young, began to seek the God of his ancestor, David. Now to be clear, it wasn't David that the king was seeking. It was David's God. How remarkable that at a young age, Josiah understood that there was a spiritual sickness spreading across the land. Idols were sprouting up everywhere faster than crops could grow. And he deliberately began seeking the Lord. Phase two took place four years later when Josiah was age 20. He immediately began purifying the land of Judah and Jerusalem, Ephraim and the surrounding territories, as well as the temple of all of the idolatry that had been promoted by none other than his own father, Ammon, and by his grandfather, Manasseh, who reigned 51 years, most of it an evil and wicked reign, before he finally came to the Lord. During that period of time, the land of Judah, including the temple, had been filled with pagan shrines, with Asherah poles, to the fertility god Baal and his consort Asherah. There were images, there were incense altars, there were high places in the hills, all made in the name of idolatry. Josiah came. He not only demolished them, but he crushed them to powder. And then he took the ashes and he spread them over the graves of those who had sacrificed to these gods, to these pagan idols. Then to top it all off, he exhumed at the cemetery the bones of the priests of these false gods, these idols, and he burnt their bones on the altars, the false altars, as an intentional act of desecration. So he purified Judah and Jerusalem, as well as the temple and other notable towns using the same methods. That was phase two. Now bear with me, phase three, in the 18th year of his reign, when he was 26 years old, he began the formal process of now restoring the temple to its original intended purpose, the worship of the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, 
in phase two, he removed all traces of idolatry. And in phase three, he restored the worship of God. He appointed Levites to oversee the offerings, to pay the contractors who were inside trying to rebuild the temple that had been torn apart and neglected during the time of his idolatrous ancestors. The temple had fallen into a state of disrepair and neglect because of that idolatry. It took major carpentry, major contracting to bring it back to functional operation. That was phase three. Next, phase four is perhaps the most significant of this revival under Josiah because it was set off by a discovery in the very temple of the Lord. Hard to believe. Hilkiah the high priest, who was recording the offerings that had been collected uh, for the temple renovations, apparently was moving one of those offering boxes and he came across a scroll. Perhaps in uh, this time the, the uh, interest had abated. Nobody even recognized that the Bible was missing from the temple. Can you imagine? The scroll contained the book of the law of Moses and it was immediately conveyed to the king, King Josiah, who then conveyed it to Huldah the prophetess for an interpretation of its meaning. Huldah basically said, I'm sorry, I have some bad news. God's judgment is on its way in the form of destruction of Jerusalem and destruction of the people because they have abandoned him and they have given themselves over to idolatry. Now I want to go back to the term revival because we sang about it in almost all of the hymns this morning. That word appeared in scripture and in the hymns. That has fallen out of use in this third millennium, here in America especially. And one of the reasons that it may have fallen out of use in Christian circles among Christian people is that we have assumed that the rampant paganism and the evolution of evil is so now invasive and so unstoppable that we have just settled back and accepted there will be no revival. Well, Webster defines revival this way, a reviving or being revived Specifically, A, a bringing or coming back into use, attention or being after a period of decline. B, restoration to vigor and activity. C, a returning to life or consciousness. D, a stirring of religious faith by fervid evangelistic preaching at public meetings. And E, such a meeting or series of meetings would have public confession of sins and professions of renewed faith. In this book, in Psalm 85, 6, the psalmist prayed, will you not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Now in Hebrew, the word revive is shayah and it refers to something that is already alive, but it's needing revitalization. I took the car for state inspection last week. My, to live in Pittsburgh is unbelievable when it comes to inspection. I've never lived anywhere where there are such strict standards. Now I knew going into inspection that the car had some issues underneath, but I underestimated those issues and then with a pitiful tone the and squinting eyes the mechanic looked right at me and said given the age of this vehicle you're going to start and be nickeled and dimed to death well after i saw the estimate for repair i'd welcome nickels and dimes So in short, the car is functional, don't misunderstand me to a degree, but now due to its age, it needs revitalization. That's the physical dimension of revival. 
But when we as God's people, as Christ's church, speak of revival, we have a spiritual component in mind, a stirring of religious faith or devotion that stems from a renewed sense of reverence and fear of Almighty God who could come in at any moment and judge us. And we know that there's a public confession of sin that's involved and there's a repentance before God. And we know that there is a, usually with revival professions of a renewed faith and a recommitment to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and all that that means. Now it may be worthwhile to pause here and reflect for just a moment on five great revivals in Euro-American history. First, you know, and I'm sure you've heard of the First Great Awakening. That's the 1730s in England and in the colonies. Now churches had become lax. Um, the requirements for church membership and participation had almost disappeared. Any uh, pig with a suit of clothes could walk in and become a member. Uh, the practice was called uh, the halfway covenant and uh, it allowed children of non-believing parents to be baptized uh, and in good faith and to be received into the church uh, based on the hope that they would be instructed in the morals of the Christian faith. Now you know what happened? That inadvertently led to the church being filled up with people who didn't know Christ. They were brought in as children. Exactly what the Anabaptists of Switzerland fought and died to prevent. They said only people who have met Christ, who have made a personal decision and came here and were baptized in his name, only they can be admitted to the church. Now the principal devout movers used by God to bring revival in this particular situation, the first great awakening, were Jonathan Edwards, John Wesley, Charles Wesley, the hymn writer, and then George Whitfield. And these men traveled up and down the colonies and they preached and people were convicted of sin and their need to be uh, renewed in the knowledge and faith of Jesus and obedience of Jesus Christ. Now that was the first great awakening. The second great awakening was the 1820s to 1850. And throughout England and America, the moral fabric of society was tattered, it was torn. Uh, there were misplaced affections, uh, the desire to usher in the uh, second coming of Jesus Christ uh, provided a strong impetus for people to be praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the man that God used at this particular time during the second great awakening was a man named Charles Finney. And Charles Finney had one theme in his preaching, repentance. You must be born again if you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And whereas the first great awakening was largely intended to and aimed at the church, the second great awakening was aimed at the wider society, everyone, inside and outside the church. And it helped to create the anti-slavery movement, women's suffrage, the Salvation Army, the YMCA, and it added to the numbers and growth of both the Baptist and the Methodist denomination. That's the second great awakening. The third followed in Chicago in 1875 to 1885 when D.L. Moody, a young man who was selling shoes, was converted to Christ and then uh, what happened in Chicago in 1871 was Mrs. O'Leary was with her cow in the barn and the cow kicked over the lantern. The lantern fell on the fresh hay, set all of Chicago on fire. And people finally realized, you know what? If I died tomorrow, what's the future? Moody started a Bible study for the homeless street children from that fire. He started Moody Church. He started the Moody Bible Institute. He presented the gospel simply with both invitation and warning. That's the third great awakening. Now the fourth was the Azusa Street Revival 
in Los Angeles in 1906 through 1915, and humanism was spreading rapidly, and people were becoming presumptuous that man could solve his own problems. He didn't need God. He was perfectly adequate. He could control his own future. And what happened at Azusa Street in Los Angeles was what led to the Pentecostal movement. So that on April 9th, 1906, the Spirit of God fell on several Christians who had been gathered and they began speaking in tongue. That came to be called the second blessing or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And uh, of course, it's very good to be reminded of Romans 8, 9, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't belong to Christ, period. And then came finally the fifth revival, the 20th century revival from 1910 to the 1970s under the Billies. Billy Sunday and the more familiar farm boy from North Carolina, Billy Graham. The industrial age was in full force. Darwinism was reshaping values. It was being taught in schools. And much like the revivals before it, the period was noted for large gatherings and uh, accusation of sin and warning people about the gates of hell if they didn't change the course of their lives. And Billy Sunday was a professional baseball player turned preacher. He was down to earth. He was direct with his gospel message so that beginning in 1907, he preached to 1.5 million people around the country in month-long meetings uh, until his death in 1935 due to a heart attack. Billy Graham now enters the scene in 1949 with the Los Angeles Crusade. It caught the attention of the press thanks to William Randolph Hearst who uh, sent a telegram to all of his editors saying, Puff Graham. And Billy Graham got exposure. And he went on to more than 400 crusades in 185 countries with arena-sized crowds and broadcasting over radio and television until finally his death on February 21st, 2018 at the age of 100. You see, Billy Graham emphasized the need for a personal decision to accept Jesus Christ. He warned people that you cannot get there on the coattails of your mother and father. You cannot get there by any kind of church membership. You cannot get there by any kind of doing good. And his preaching was with great unction. Now, do you know what the church, Jesus told the church at Sardis? He said, you have a name that you're alive. You have a reputation that you're an alive church, but you're dead. You're dead. Now, today, the church in America is sick. That's not speculation. That's observable fact. The church is not just a little under the weather. It's not just a matter of a, a few sniffles and sneezes. It's severely ill, and it's in great peril. It's not prepared for the arrival of the bridegroom or the marriage feast. Carnality, compromise, and compatibility have replaced the earlier emphasis on holiness, devotion, and separation to God. From east to west, north to south, the American church is ailing. It's in a state of decline. There are churches that have declined in spiritual vitality as Sardis, but they've retained numbers. Then there's churches that have declined in spiritual vitality and in numbers. Then there are churches that are growing in number, but have lost spiritual vitality. They no longer know why they exist. Then there are churches that are as stagnant as a mud farm pond in the middle of summer. And then there are churches that have become apostate and deny the blood of Jesus Christ. Now it's good to remind ourselves that churches are made up of individuals, you and me. And usually when we join that church, we make a profession of faith and there's certain, uh, there's certain criteria that are in place. We've met, know, and follow Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. 
We've been baptized in obedience to his command to be baptized. We've joined a local church. We receive the Lord's Supper uh, periodically, and we even participate in the ongoing operation of the church from day to day, week to week. But there's, there's still a dead giveaway. There's one dead giveaway that the church in America is in need of revival. It's one word. Powerlessness. If the church is really walking in the spirit, and that's where the power is, Jesus said the flesh profits nothing, it's the spirit that gives life. If the church is really walking in the spirit, then why is there so much carnality in the church? If the church is concerned about souls, then where is all the travail? You know, Paul said, I travail until Christ be formed in you. Where is the travail in, in prayer for souls that are lost and on their way to a Christless eternity, to hell? If the church takes the word of God seriously and uh, 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 is, believes in it, then why are so many of our decisions based on convenience rather than on scripture? If the church is serious about following Jesus, then why is discipleship so sloppy, so lacking? If belonging to the church is so important, why are some so casual about their personal responsibility within the body of Christ? Now in Josiah's case, as in every period of revival throughout history, there's one thing that makes a difference. There's a rediscovery of this book. Just like Josiah's high priest rediscovered in the temple the scroll that had been ignored and was in some back closet that everybody forgot it. Why is that important? Why is the Bible important? Why is rediscovery of the Bible and rereading the Bible and becoming again familiar with what the Bible says, why is that important? Why? Because of Romans 3.10. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. I wouldn't know lust unless this Bible said, thou shalt not covet. Unless as a human being I know the law of God, I will not understand why my sin was so black, so ugly, that Jesus Christ had to go and die on the cruelest form and cruelest instrument of death, the cross. Well, we can shrug our face at lying, gossip, pride, hypocrisy, laziness, cowardice, resisting the Holy Spirit. But to be clear, when we're speaking about revival, genuine Holy Ghost revival, we're not now speaking about doing things a little different, tweaking the order of worship, painting the walls, although there's nothing wrong with that. We're not talking about starting a new program. We're not talking about reinventing ourselves. We're not talking about a new Bible study, no, no. Revival is a cry for the Holy Spirit to come down and purify our personal lives to the glory of God. See, it's only a revived church that brings glory to God. Jesus said, in this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. You know what the psalmist prayed? My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. Don't revive me according to my own understanding or to my comparison to what others are doing. Is your soul clinging to the dust? The dust of this world. 
or to God Almighty. Can't be both. You're clinging to one or the other. No man can serve two masters. Josiah summoned all of the leaders. They went up to the temple. He stood at the pillar where the king stands. And he called everyone together. He called the priests, he called the Levites, he called all the people from the little children to the elderly, and he renewed right in front of them the covenant of the Lord. Then he personally pledged to obey it himself, and he required everyone else to do the same. I go back to Jesus' words in Mark 2.17. Those who are well do not need a physician. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know what, I, I take great comfort in that, don't you? I mean, Jesus is saying this, if I could put it in this way. He's saying, if you think that you are living above average, then you don't need me. But if you know that you're living below average, then here's my card. Call on me, morning, noon, or night. I came to call sinners. I came to call them to repent and live. But somebody who's hardened his heart, who thinks they're above repentance, I didn't come for them. Don't stay backslidden. Don't stay defeated. Don't stay run down. Come to me and be revived. What did Peter say on the day of Pentecost? Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. What about you? What about me? What about the church? Locally, universally. What needs to be revitalized in your relationship to God, to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit? What needs restoration to vigor and activity after being in decline? Putting away idols? Getting back to the word. A prayer life that needs to be recharged. Do we need to take a better look at ourselves in the mirror and ask what, what, what kind of witness am I for Jesus Christ? I mean, what, what do people see in me? Is there anything credible and convincing about my faith, or, or is it just showmanship? I close with this. King William of Prussia in the 1800s found himself in trouble after his many victories, his many conquests. With no money left in the imperial treasury, for wars and rebuilding, he had to do something, and he had to do something fast. The king went to the women of the land, to the women of the land, to bring their gold and silver jewelry so that it could be melted down. And in return, the king issued them an iron decoration. It was stamped with these words. I gave gold for iron. 1813. Well, surprisingly, what happened over time, these symbols, these pieces of iron, became more prized than any piece of jewelry because they were proof that the woman had sacrificed her most treasured jewels 
for King William. Jewelry lost its fashionableness. And the order of the cross, the iron cross, was born. And the question I leave with you today is, are you willing to pay the price for revival? All of us have sinned, and all of us have sinned. But I would say this, the sin of mediocrity is perhaps the sin that shames the name of Jesus Christ more than any other. So what will it be? Will you bring wood, hay, and stubble and lay them at the feet of Christ? Or will you bring gold, silver, and precious metals? That's the price. Are we willing to pay it? I trust that we are.